Hello students, welcome to the lecture on Introduction to International Marketing Management and after this lecture we will be able to learn the following objectives. Understand the barriers in international marketing management, concept of tariff, define tariff, understand the effects of barriers in international marketing management and review related studies. Let us start with what international marketing is. International marketing can be defined as exchange of goods and services between different national markets involving buyers and sellers. According to the American Marketing Association, international marketing is the multinational process of planning and executing the conception, prices, promotion and distribution of ideal goods and services to create exchanges that satisfy the individual and organizational objectives. Domestic Marketing Domestic marketing is concerned with marketing practices within the marketer's home country. Foreign Marketing It refers to domestic marketing within the foreign country. Comparative Marketing When two or more marketing systems are studied, the subject of study is known as comparative marketing. In such a study, both similarities and dissimilarities are identified. International marketing. It is concerned with the micro aspects of a market and takes the company as a unit of analysis. International trade. International trade is concerned with flow of goods and services between the countries. Global marketing. Global marketing considers the world as a whole as the theatre of operation. The purpose of global marketing is to learn to recognise the extent to which marketing plans and programmes can be extended worldwide and the extent to which they must be adopted. Marketing is the process of focusing the resources and objectives of an organisation on environmental opportunities and needs. It is a universal discipline. However, markets and customers are different and hence the practice of marketing should be fine-tuned and adjusted to the local conditions of a given country. The marketing man must understand that each person is different and so also each country, which means that both experience and techniques obtained and successful in one country or countries. International marketing requires managers to behave both globally and locally simultaneously by responding to similarities and dissimilarities in international markets. Globalization can be a source of competitive advantage. Exports and Imports International trade can be a good beginning to venture into international marketing. By developing international markets for domestically produced goods and services, a company can reduce the risk of operating internationally, gain adequate experience and then go on to set up manufacturing and marketing facilities abroad. The fundamental reason for international trade is to sell something that we don't need and to buy something we do need. Trade creates jobs, attracts investment, attracts new technology and materials and offers Canadians a wider choice in products and services. People spend, save or pay taxes with the money they earn in their jobs. The government uses taxes to provide services which creates more jobs. When people save, the capital markets lend money to others who will spend it on consumer goods or open or expand a business, therefore creating new jobs. Unlike the battering that used to go on between trading partners, now businesses receive money from selling their products or services to foreign businesses. When foreign businesses buy Canadian products, it creates jobs for Canadians. Exports are very important to Canadians. They create one out of three Canadian jobs. 40% of what Canadians produce is exported. 1 billion exports means 6,000 jobs for Canadians. 
When trade is balanced, businesses remain profitable and may grow. Investment follows trade. Many foreign companies will invest in an office, factory or distribution warehouse to simplify their trade and reduce cost. This investment also creates more jobs. It also attracts international investors. New technology promotes competitiveness and profitability. If a business could create a machine that works better, faster or cheaper or all three, then the business will have produced a more competitive product for national and international markets. The biotechnology industry in Canada is second only to the US. The global market has made it easy to buy and sell international goods. While this has benefits, it also presents a problem. Such trade can cause countries to be prosperous for a short time but leads to economic exploitation, loss of cultural identity and even physical harm. Great hardship can be caused. When people make poor decisions about land use or surplus production for export and do not take the general population's welfare into consideration. Culture is a major export in the world. It displays and promotes values and lifestyles worldwide. The culture consumer in other countries is sometimes overwhelmed by American ideas. Products also carry cultural ideas and messages. There are values of the culture that make the product. Maintaining safety standards, minimum wages, workers' compensation and health benefits are all social welfare issues that cost business money. Precious commodities such as gold, diamond, oil or farmland are so important for countries to have control that wars have been started and as a result, people are killed. The term globalization has acquired considerable emotive force. Some view it as a beneficial process, a key to future world economic development and also inevitable and irreversible. Others regard it with hostility, even fear, believing that it increases inequality within and between nations, threatens employment and living standards and thwarts social progress. Global marketing is expansive, extensive and complex. It can be seen as both a business strategy and an operation, as a force for good and or as the new imperialism. It can be embodied in companies or perceived as a phenomenon, example, business globalization, the internet, etc. One view of global marketing is as a giant supply chain management system or an added value system. Global marketing arena is a complex issue. Marketing across political and cultural boundaries raises many questions, problems and juxtapositions rendering precise dentitions difficult. Typical issues center on the standardization, adaptation argument, locus of control, central or developed, and when exactly a multinational corporation focuses becomes a global one. The advent of new technologies, example the internet and the world wide web, mobile devices, digital TV, has opened up business and marketing opportunities in the development of innovative products and services and the creation of new values to consumers. For instance, conventional marketing and targeting techniques allow an organization to reach hundreds, thousands or even tens of thousands of potential customers. But with a personal computer and a modem, the organization can reach a community of millions at a fraction of the cost. By 2012, e-marketer projects that over 1.7 billion people worldwide, 24.5%, will access the internet at least once per month. Nearly 50% of the world's internet population will live in the Asia-Pacific region. When large market segments can be identified, economies of scale in production and marketing can be important competitive advantages for global companies. 
transfer of experience and know-how across countries through improved coordination and integration of marketing activities. Marketing globally also ensures that marketers have access to the toughest customers. Diversity of markets served carriers with it additional financial benefits. Firms that market globally are able to take advantage of changing financial circumstances. Planning is the job of making things happen that might not otherwise occur. Planning allows for rapid growth of the international function, changing markets, increasing competition and the turbulent challenges of different national markets. Planning relates to the formulation of goals and methods of accomplishing them, so it is both a process and philosophy. Successful planning is evaluating company objectives, including management's commitment and philosophical orientation to international business. Phase 1 Preliminary Analysis and Screening Matching Company and Country Needs Phase 2 Adapting the Marketing Mix to Target Markets Phase 3 Developing the Marketing Plan Phase 4 Implementation and Control An entry strategy into the international market should reflect on analysis of market characteristics such as potential sales, strategic importance, locus of decision, considerations of where decisions will be made, by whom and by which method constitutes a major element of organizational strategy. An infinite number of organizational patterns for the headquarters activities of multinational firms exist, but most fit into one of three categories – centralized, regionalized, decentralized. In order to fully understand the four P's, it's important to understand the history behind their development. It all started with the term marketing mix. In the 1940s, James Culleton described the position of marketing manager as someone who is a mixer of ingredients. More than a decade later, Neil H. Borden published the concept of the marketing mix, which was an adaptation of Culleton's original theory. The marketing mix included product pricing, planning, branding, distribution channels, advertising, promotions, personal selling, packaging, display, servicing, physical handling, and fact-finding and analysis. It wasn't until E. Jerome McCarthy grouped each aspect into four categories or the four P's of marketing. Now let us find more about this video here. Now, if you were to take a formal class in marketing, which this is not, I'm going to give you a little view of it, you'd probably take a textbook that has four P's somewhere in the title or inside the textbook. How many have heard of the four P's of marketing? Okay, a couple of you have. Well, the first P is the one you often think about because it's about your product or service. Now, product in marketing doesn't mean tangible personal property like this. A product can be a service, something you never touch or see, you just receive. Okay, so product is used in a broad sense. Sometimes I use the word offering so that you can understand that it's both. Some of you offer products and services to support it. But products should be pointing at the customer. It's what the customer needs that you're providing. Not just because you can build it. It's not like the movie. Build it and they'll come. Products should be customer driven, not technology driven. Then place is another P. We'll be talking about place later. But place is simply a word. How do I get it from my place to your place? Or do you come to my place? It's distribution. They wanted four P's, so they came up with the P word place for distribution. And there's a whole area of expertise about distribution. Promotion is sometimes what people think about in marketing. That's all the stuff that tells people that you have a new product or service and how to get it. And of course, then there's that final important P, price. What am I going to pay for it? Notice, all of these are pointing toward one thing, the customer. Here's what sometimes happen even with small businesses and sometimes large businesses. They forget about the center. 
they get all wrapped up in the ring around the edges. They all focused on their product or their distribution model or their promotion or their pricing model and they forget to walk in the shoes of the customers. Sales promotions are activities that are usually short term designed to quickly stimulate demand by encouraging customers to purchase our products or services. These may include coupons, free samples, contests with attractive prizes, organizing demonstrations and exhibitions, interest-free periods and temporary price reductions. The following factors should be considered to increase the success of our sales promotions. Develop a promotional plan or action plan that determines the promotion objectives, budget and suitable time span, etc. Design a creative message that focuses on the unique selling proposition and clearly promotes the customer benefits of the offer. Always try to be conscious of any similar competitor offers and try and differentiate our promotion where possible. Ensure we maintain credibility by only offering what we can actually deliver. We don't want to fall short of the promise to customers and create customer dissatisfaction. Public relations, often referred to as PR, involves managing communication between our organization and any individual or group that is connected to or affected by it in some way. This could be our customers, suppliers, employees, government or the general public. Public relations can have various goals including education, building or improving a brand or image. The internet can be a great way to do business especially with the increase in the number of people with access to online facilities. Online advertising is similar to print advertising in that it offers a visual message. However, it has some additional advantages in comparison to other modes of advertising. Now let us watch a video on marketing. What is marketing? There are plenty of common misconceptions about marketing, so before we get into what marketing really is, here are some examples of what it isn't. Number one, first misconception, marketing is evil. A lot of people think that marketing has no inherent value and that its only purpose is to separate people from their money. That is not the case. Of course not everyone will agree with every part of every marketing campaign, but just because you don't like part of something doesn't mean that all of it is evil or even wrong. I mean, if you hate Brussels sprouts, it doesn't follow you think that every vegetable is a crime against nature, right? Now, we can assume that you don't fall prey to this particular myth. Most people who think marketing is evil only do so because they've been fooled by myth number two. The second myth is that marketing is advertising. We all understand why folks get tired of commercials selling deodorant and soft drinks during their television shows and flashy banner ads for anything and everything at the top of every website they visit. The truth of the matter is that some advertisements are annoying, but advertising is not all that marketing is. It's only a small part of a well-developed effective marketing plan, the idea of which will probably make you think of myth number three. And that myth is that marketing is expensive. A misconception is that only big companies with giant marketing budgets can afford to advertise effectively and that the little guys may as well not even bother. Not true. You can design and develop a solid and effective marketing campaign for almost any budget. Stick with us, we'll show you how. Now that we've gotten some of the elephants out of the room, let's move on to what marketing is. There are lots of different definitions and almost every business person has their own. We actually have different definitions ourselves. I like to say that marketing is the process of aligning your offering with the customer's needs and communicating that to them. And my favorite definition is that marketing is the process of creating and maintaining a customer relationship. We're both right. Danny's definition is very communication oriented and no wonder he's a communication strategist. What this definition means in more detail is that marketing is about giving your customers what they want and then telling them that you're giving them what they want. If someone wants something and they know you have it, they'll probably buy it from you. Peter's definition that marketing is the process of creating and maintaining customer relationships takes in the whole large scope of marketing. 
Any contact you have with a customer is a potential marketing opportunity, and because of that, having a solid customer relationship based on trust is incredibly important. Marketing is so much more than just advertising and promotion. Marketing is customer service and distribution. Marketing is communication. Anytime you get information about a product or service, that's marketing. Even if you heard about it from your mother-in-law. When your computer breaks down and you call the company about the warranty, that's marketing. When you go to the grocery store and see the shelves filled with different products, that's marketing too. How can this be? A good marketer makes an effort to know and understand their customers so that they can provide something that's useful and valuable for them. Aligning what you sell with the needs of the customer and developing an honest, genuine relationship with that customer is what marketing is really all about. That's why communication is so important. Under the marketing concept, the firm must find a way to discover unfulfilled customer needs and bring to market products that satisfy that need. The process of doing so can be modeled in a sequence of steps. The situation is analyzed to identify opportunities, the strategy formulated for a value proposition. Tactical decisions are made, the plan is implemented and the results are monitored. A thorough analysis of the situation in which firm finds itself serves as the basis for identifying opportunities to satisfy unfulfilled customer need. In addition to identifying the customer needs, the firm must understand its own capabilities and the environment in which it is operating. Once the best opportunity to satisfy unfulfilled customer needs is identified, a strategic plan for pursuing the opportunity can be developed. Market research will provide specific market information that will permit the firm to select the target market segment and optimally position the offering within that segment. Detailed tactical decisions then are made for the controllable parameters of the marketing mix. The action items include product development, specifying, designing and producing the first units of the product, pricing decision, distribution contracts and promotional campaign development. At this point in the process, the marketing plan has been developed and the product has been launched. Given that few environments are static, the results of the marketing effort should be monitored closely. As the market changes, the marketing mix can be adjusted to accommodate the changes. Often, small changes in consumer wants can address by changing in advertising message. A person who assumes that his or her home country is superior to the rest of the world is said to have an ethnocentric orientation. Ethnocentrism is sometimes associated with attitudes of national arrogance or assumptions of national superiority. It can also manifest itself as indifference to marketing opportunities outside the home country. Company personnel with an ethnocentric orientation see only similarities in markets and assume that products and practices that succeed in the home country will be successful anywhere. The polycentric orientation is the opposite of ethnocentrism. The term polycentric describes management's belief or assumption that each country in which a company does business is unique. This assumption lays the groundwork for each subsidiary to develop its own unique business and marketing strategies in order to succeed. The term multinational company is often used to describe such a structure. In a company with a regiocentric orientation, a region becomes the relevant geographic unit. Management's goal is to develop an integrated regional strategy. What does regional mean in this context? A US company that focuses on the countries included in the North American Free Trade Agreement, NAFTA, namely the United States, Canada and Mexico, have a regiocentric orientation. Some companies serve markets throughout the world but do so on a regional basis. A company with a geocentric orientation 
views the entire world as a potential market and strives to develop integrated global strategies. A company whose management has adopted a geocentric orientation is sometimes known as a global or transnational company. During the past several years, long-standing regiocentric policies at GM, such as those previously discussed, have been replaced by a geocentric approach. The term ethnocentrism refers to a traditional concept in social sciences. It has been widely used in psychology and sociology to investigate in group versus out-group conflicts and segregation between members of different cultural entities. Except for anthrocentrism, research in consumer behavior. However, this basic concept has not yet been applied to international management research. It's being centered on, right, like egocentric, centered on yourself, ethnocentric, centered on your own ethnic groups, beliefs, practices, right? Now, we are all ethnocentric. All human beings are ethnocentric, right? It is a device that allows you to make decisions more quickly so that you can actually do things with your daily life, right? If you had to wake up every morning and say to yourself, Wait a minute, what's an appropriate breakfast food? Is cereal an appropriate breakfast food? Is steak an appropriate breakfast food? Should I eat the cockroaches that have been harassing me in the kitchen? Which of these things are breakfast? You would never finish your breakfast and make it to WSU, right? So what ethnocentrism does is it narrows your possible choices so that you don't have to question what is good or bad in every movement you make, right? But it also limits us, especially when we are in contact with people who have different ideas than we do, yeah. right? And we feel this way about a lot of our food choices, right? A lot of them we haven't learned explicitly, but we learn them tacitly and they, and they stick, right? So my husband and I, as an example, always have this or often have this sort of little discussion where I say, I don't want to eat any more Asian food. I'm sick of eating rice. And he says, I don't want to eat any more of your food. I'm sick of eating potatoes, right? And we're at an impasse because the carbohydrate staple of our culture is different. And your carbohydrate staple, you're going to be ethnocentric about because you eat it all the time. It's what you're supposed to eat. It's, it doesn't taste like anything. It just tastes like what you put on it, right? Oh, they all have their own tastes, right? So food is something that we tend to be really ethnocentric about, right? Meaning. So again, when I'm in Tanzania, the food staple that um, my friends in um, the urban center that I work with in Dar es Salaam, um, and most mainland Tanzanians eat, is called ugali. Ugali is kind of like, um, if anybody here eats grits, if you were to make grits from a much finer food to grind it to like a flour, and then boil it until it thickens, like you do with grits, that's what ugali is like. And you eat ugali like in a big mound, it's your starch, and you get like something that's a sauce around it, and you make little balls of ugali. Mm -hmm. And so part of eating ugali, people told me that I would never enjoy my food because I wanted to eat with a fork, and everybody knows that the, the kneading process of making the little ball makes the ugali taste better. And then you, you scoop up some of the sauce and you eat it, right? So people would ask when, when I, was, I was dragged all over the mountainous region of Tanzania, as my adopted mother took me to see all of her 13 siblings and, and eat in everybody's house and sleep over in everybody's house to show that I was comfortable in everybody's house this long trip. And one thing that kept being asked of me is, you know, they see that I'm with this Tanzanian family and that they're comfortable with me, so I might be okay. But something people often ask was, does she eat ugali? And if I said, I love ugali, they said, all oh, right, welcome to Tanzania, right? You're one of us, you're okay. But if I said, Right, then they were like, you're a jerk, right, because that's actually my food. And frankly, I don't like ugali. It's not my potatoes, right? Um, but, you know, here, food, certain kinds of food represent nationalism, right? And a commitment or um, an acceptance of 
everyday life in a particular region. Right? So, um, food is a great example of a place where we can often, even those of us who like trained cultural anthropologists, um, catch ourselves being ethnocentric. I have a friend who uh, works in Amazon, in the Amazonian River Basin, and he, in the group where he works, um, they um, eat this kind of um, the larva stage of a particular beetle. And so when people are like, you know, moving logs around, they sometimes find these larvas and they sometimes they roast them, but sometimes they just eat them, right? And he talked about how one of the biggest challenges in his field work in the Amazon was learning to eat a larva and make the yummy face because he was grossed out by them, right? As most of us in the United States are, if we were to be told to eat that larva. That's something like we make game shows about, right? Um, and so he got really good at it. He was so proud of himself. And at one point, he's moving around in the rainforest. He's an ethnobotanist, so he's collecting all kinds of, they're taking him far afield to get plant samples. And they come in contact with a neighboring tribe. And here, they've got this white guy with them, you know? And so there's already, two groups are already a little bit antagonistic, and now they're wondering, like, what are you doing with this guy? And so he's trying to establish rapport with this outside group. And so he kicks over a law, and he sees one of those larvae, and he says, oh, and he eats one and makes the yummy face. That's all proud of himself. And the other group went, oh, gross, and, like, left. Because they didn't eat those larvae. You know, here's a place where, you know, even these two very close groups have very different ideas about what is good and what is not good. There's lots of behaviors that we do inadvertently that are ethnocentric. If you guys give me an essay, sometimes you'll get it back with something circled saying, this is a little ethnocentric, particularly when we use certain terms, like we say in primitive cultures, um, or um, oftentimes people use the term tribe or tribal as a pejorative term. Um, there is an anthropological use of that. It's been absorbed into the anthropological sort of jargon. But the way that people colloquially use these, these words oftentimes is in a pejorative way, right? All those primitive people, right? This is ethnocentric. There's an assumption of hierarchization in the way that that is used. The term ethnocentrism stems from a more general concept developed by Sumner. In the beginning, ethnocentrism was a purely sociological construct describing in-group versus out-group conflicts. Sumner defines anthrocentrism as view of things in which one's group is the center of everything and others are scaled and rated with reference to it. Each group nourishes its own pride and vanity, boasts itself superior, exalts its own divinities and looks with contempt on outsiders. Taking the general stakeholder concept as a basis for an analysis, it becomes clear that corporate strategies are influenced by numerous different interest groups and or different strategies are adapted to distinct groups. In the context of international corporate management, it can be assumed that exchange relations between these corporations and specific stakeholder groups are, besides other factors, characterized by the corporation-wide anthrocentrism and ethnocentrism of stakeholders in different target countries. Now in the end, let us summarize what we have learned in this lecture. International marketing can be defined as exchange of goods and services between different national markets involving buyers and sellers. The concepts of international marketing are domestic marketing, foreign marketing, comparative marketing, international marketing, international trade, global marketing. Global marketing is expansive, extensive and complex. It can be seen as both a business strategy and an operation, as a force for good and or as the new imperialism. The four P's of marketing mix are product, price, place, and promotion. Sales promotions are activities that are usually short-term, designed to quickly stimulate demand by encouraging customers to purchase our products or services. A person who assumes that his or her home country is superior to the rest of the world 
is said to have an ethnocentric orientation. The polycentric orientation is the opposite of ethnocentrism. In a company with a regiocentric orientation, a region becomes the relevant geographic unit. A company with a geocentric orientation views the entire world as a potential market and strives to develop integrated global strategies. Ethnocentrism was a purely sociological construct describing in-group versus out-group conflicts. Samra defines ethnocentrism as the view of things in which one's group is the center of everything and others are scaled and rated with reference to it.